Hello, everyone. Welcome, Trailblazers. My name is Eric Chenmo. I'm a product manager on the Alexa for Business team in AWS. Uh, I will apologize. I am getting over a uh, cold, so I'm a little scratchy and I might cough a few times, but uh, I will stay on this side of the room. So uh, first off, thank you for coming to this session. I know there's so many interesting topics, lots of things to see and do here. So it means a lot that you've come here to hear about Alexa, conversational interfaces, and what that means for Salesforce. So maybe to kick things off, I know we're a little post-lunch. How many people have an Echo or smart speaker at home? OK, cool, majority of the room. And I think it's really interesting because really, in the past few years, the power of deep neural networks, natural language understanding, have made leaps and bounds in this technology. Now we've sold tens of millions of Alexa-enabled devices to bring a digital assistant to the home. This has made differences both big, <coughs> big and small. You know, Tom and I, who will be presenting later, we're talking this morning and about, you know, it's really put the power back in control of people who, you know, maybe if you don't have the physical ability to turn a light on, something as simple as saying, Alexa, turn on the lights is a really kind of a mind blowing experience. And now it also has the ability to have what we call skills. So if you don't have a smart speaker, a skill on a voice, a smart speaker assistant is as analogous to an app on your phone. With Alexa, there are over 50,000 public skills available now. They cover the range of things like sleep sounds to help you, your family, fall asleep at night. You can have uh, banking. You can get your credit card balance. You can pay your bills. And there are games like Jeopardy with Alex Trebek's voice. Uh, if you've ever played role-playing games, you can play Skyrim over Alexa. So it's kind of crazy the, the different types of things you can do now just using your voice. And the other cool thing is now that we have all these different types of devices, you can have one in your home, you can have an Echo Show, you can put one next to your bed. The recently announced Echo Auto is coming soon, so you can have it in your car. So now we're covering the home, we're covering your car. Where else do you spend your time? Work. And so it becomes very interesting when you think about what can you do that you have a digital assistant at work? And so one of the first things that we zeroed in on was conference calls. All right. So who doesn't have the experience of leading a conference call? You got to dial the number. Oh, maybe you got the number wrong. OK, you got to start over, dial the number again. What's the pin? Uh, putting that in. Oh, got that number wrong. Now you're starting to sweat. And you're nervous. You're not starting the meeting off right. And now the number of people you have in the meeting, the more senior those people are, that's some real dollars and cents that you're wasting in productivity. So in last November, AWS launched Alexa for Business. This is our way to bring Alexa into the workplace. There's a bunch of challenges why you can't bring a, a standard consumer Echo into a workplace. Things like, when I want to register an Echo, I have to use my app. I can do one at a time. If I'm talking about, as an administrator, hundreds, thousands of conference rooms, that's not going to work. And now, Alexa for Business adds this device management layer on top of what Alexa already gives you. This allows administrators to manage and deploy devices at scale. We've also introduced something called private skills. This makes it so you don't have to have a skill that's one of 50,000. You can make a skill just for your business or your employees. These are all things that enterprises, organizations, businesses need to use Alexa. So diving into, the, sorry, diving into conference rooms a little more, it's actually really interesting to look at how complex this is at many businesses. You may have different types of hardware. You could have a Cisco video system, a Polycom phone, a Crestron speaker, a smart blinds and projectors. You can have different conference providers at the same company. You, you can have Chime, you could have WebEx, Skype, Ring Central, Zoom, the list goes on and on. The beauty of putting an Alexa in that conference room is anyone can walk in and say, Alexa, start the meeting. Doesn't matter what that configuration was. Is there anything we can do about the blinking? Sorry, we'll continue to look at that. So, Again, the beauty of that is now Alexa simplifies that. No matter what the room setup was, no matter if you're a new joiner, you've been there for 10 years, you know how to use the tablet, you can just say, Alexa, start the meeting. So customers of ours like Johnson & Johnson, Brooks Brothers, Propel Insurance, they're all kind of moving down this conference room enablement. Even at Amazon, we have over 700 rooms enabled with Alexa devices now. And we're seeing about a 70% utilization rate of the Alexa device versus the existing in-room tablet, phone, et cetera. 
One of the funny things at Amazon is you expect to move buildings all the time. Our team actually recently moved to a building that wasn't set up yet with Alexa devices. I had this moment where I walked in and I was like, I forgot my pin. I used to have it memorized. You dial it every day during those conference calls, and I had forgotten it. And so that's just one of those things that just, it gets to you of how much it impacts your day-to-day -day life. So, <laughs> that's okay. So one of the other things that I talk about here is now the difference between when I put an Alexa at my home versus when I put an Alexa in a conference room. In the conference room, we have this term that we call shared devices. It is shared because many different people would use it. It's not tied to my credit card, my to-do list, my skills. It's, it's kind of a business uh, device. And so that enables you to have now a locational awareness. If I put an Echo device in the third floor copy room, I can mark that in the Alexa for Business console. And now I know there's a difference between the third floor copy room and the fourth floor copy room if I say, you know, reorder me paper. If I tie that to my Salesforce purchase order flow, I can know, oh, the cost center on the third floor is different than the fourth floor. But the people there didn't have to know that. They just said, order me more paper. So it enables that kind of awareness and knowledge to make everything simpler for the employees. We also enable companies who sell products and services to also add voice to them. Volara is one of our hotel partners, and so they build software for hotel companies to provide their guests a better experience. So now guests can go into these hotel rooms with an Echo device, and they can use that device to control the blinds, they can turn the lights on and off, they can order room service, if they need towels, if they forgot a toothbrush, they can do all those things using the device. For the hotels, they're given this interface where they can customize the flows, they can change what Alexa says back, and they can tie it into their systems, like Salesforce and the other hoteling uh, configuration systems. The final thing on here is helping you at your desk. So I mentioned that private skill concept. So imagine if I was a, a sales leader and I want to give my sales team the most efficient tools to do their job. What I can do is build a private Salesforce skill that allows them to get an update on their forecasts, find and update opportunities, uh, allow them to update their calendar on the fly, and I can give it just to my salespeople. I don't have to worry about my competitors seeing it. I don't have to worry about unintended people stumbling upon it. I can use Alexa for Business to give it just to those people. That's okay. Okay. So what does it mean to build skills for Salesforce? Uh, I'm not gonna get super into the details, but fundamentally there are two different pieces to building an Alexa skill. The first thing is you have to build a voice model. You have to say, what do I expect people are going to say to my skill? And ultimately, what are they trying to do with that? So for example, if I wanted to fetch an opportunity, I might say in my voice model, my users will say, get me opportunity, blah, find me opportunity, blah, et cetera. And those all boil down to what we call an intent. And the intent there is to get an opportunity. So the second piece to a skill is what we call the fulfillment. It's the one that actually does the work. In this case, it could be something that goes and talks to Salesforce. So in order to help people do this, we've actually developed a bunch of templates to reduce the amount of code that's needed to see this in action. Uh, as we have here, we have examples that use AWS tools like Lambda, and we also have tools that use Heroku, Heroku Connect, to kind of you know, show people there are many different options to get your data out of Salesforce. So if you already have custom integrations, the beauty of Alexa is it's just another layer at the top that can use all of your existing tools. So I wanna give a quick video to introduce uh, the next speaker that will help tee up the scenario that we're gonna talk about. Where's my clicker? Does anyone know the keyboard shortcut to go full screen? Because I can't see my mouse. Let's see if I can do it by pure clicking. Oh, wow, okay. Apologies, technical difficulties. I'm uh, not fine, great. All right, I'm gonna play the video as is. I think we've got it good enough. Can we get the sound, Danny? Sorry. Thank you.
for the last 20 years, established in the early 90s. Currently, we have over two and a half billion dollars of rental apartments buildings in Manhattan only. What we used to do for unit availability, somebody would literally take a pen and pad and write down the units and the buildings that were available and distribute them after making copies by hand, and that would happen twice a day. So this was the year 2008, and we figured it was time to end. Hence, we said, you know what, let's go with a CRM solution and a platform that would allow us to do more than just CRM. And that's when we brought in Salesforce. You can check how many apartments are available at a particular building of ours. Alexa, ask office how many units are available at Stonehenge 86. There are four units available at Stonehenge 86. So this saved me a lot of energy and time. If someone a tenant opens up a maintenance case, that maintenance case is actually opened up in Salesforce. Then we can send the super or the handyman or the porter to close that case and do all the work. And he can close that case by speaking to the same Alexa unit uh, and it's all tied into Salesforce. Over to, I'd love to introduce Tom Parisi from Stonehenge. Good afternoon, everybody. How's everybody's dream force going? It's going all right? How many sessions have we done in the last day? How many miles have you put on your Fitbit or your Garmin? Yeah, I think that's the thing, right? Um, how many people have been here for more than one dream force? Two? Five? Hey, 10? Oh, OK. Yeah, so this is my 10th one running, so I've become a Salesforce disciple. Um, and a Kool-Aid drinker extraordinaire. Uh, but all seriousness, um, we've got a terrific little story that I want to tell you about. And it's not just about the Alexa voice enablement. It's about you know what we hear year after year is, I have Salesforce. We use Salesforce. But how do we get something like this to work for our Salesforce org, right? I mean, it looks great and wonderful. But how long does it take? How long, how many man hours? and what do I put on the side? How do we start? How do we finish? Who do we get involved? Can we do this in-house? So we're going to go through a little bit of, of Stonehenge's journey from the year 2009 when we first rolled out our leasing um, automation and right up until now with our partnership with AWS, which we are so happy we've uh, enrolled with them. So in 2008, like my little video said, we were doing everything like I'm sure most of your folks were doing, maybe even up until now, Excel spreadsheets, pen and paper, uh, copy machines, if we remember what a copy machine does. Uh, so we had unit inventory. And to us, that's our bread and butter, right? So if we're not renting apartments, we're going broke. So we needed to know unit availability, and we needed to get a sales cycle that was shorter than 35 days. So what we did is we automated the entire leasing process on the Salesforce platform, including um, EchoSign for e-signature on the leasing documents, which was a, a, a mind-changing, ever-changing, game-changing factor for us. It shortened the sales cycle down to about four hours. So now you can actually go see a unit on our website, apply for it on the website, and get the lease in a couple of hours and sign it, and you can actually schedule a move-in date. Uh, hence, we roll tape forward to 2010, 2011, and that was our big win. Still having a little bit of problems of adoption. You know, ops was still not gathering around the table to see what we wanted to do and how they wanted to do it. They weren't a big believer, but we got a few more wins in. Legal department said, hey, buyouts. We do buyouts and we need to keep track of you know, how we're doing that. What unit is coming off the market or coming back on the market? We built them a package. Finally, ops said, hey, can you do something? Purchase orders. So our purchase order system was, was very, very, um, I'm going to say complex and you're going to laugh. So it was complex to the fact that if I did a PO, I had to run over to Eric and say, hey, Eric, here's my PO. Eric would take the PO. He would then scan it and make a listing in a PDF file and an Excel spreadsheet file. So he'd take my PO number off his PDF that he just scanned, put it in the Excel spreadsheet file, and if somebody who wanted to approve this or see where the, the piece parts were from a building, they'd have to go to Eric. Eric would pull out his Excel spreadsheet, and you'd have to either know the date it was ordered or the vendor. You'd get the picture, right? So then we did POs. We did the POs in-house. Uh, probably took us a week to do. And this is pre Lightning Salesforce. This was Salesforce Classic before we had Flows and Process Builder, right? So we're doing all this with a little bit of Apex, a little bit of magic, and it was still only a week or two, and they had a PO process. So now the traction really caught. 
Then came along, what do we do next? You know, it's always the, what do you do next, right? Was where IT is almost like had become the new sales department. You're only as good as your last new whiz bang feature that you introduced that was real helpful, right? So we said, how about resident app? So how many of you live in a uh, multi-tenant development or a gated community where you have some sort of a portal? Yeah. So we had the same thing. What that is, is at, at the time it wasn't even an app. You had to go to a web portal and you could open up maintenance cases. You could see what your other neighbors are doing, so on and so forth. This was costing us anywhere between $3,500 and $7,000 a month per building. We said, you know what? Let's make a tenant app. How difficult can this be? So we incorporated a, a developer and we rolled this out in 87 days from beginning to end. Not beta, I'm telling you live. And this was enabled via Salesforce, via web portal, and the app was available on both web, uh, Apple Play, uh, Google Play and Apple Store to all the tenants. It was about 72 hours and we had about 3,500 subscribers, more than we ever had on any of the portal-based software. Now the nice part about this, one-time expense, now we can buy another 100 buildings and because we're using community licenses, we were scot-free. So we could add 100 buildings on without adding on any additional cost. The app is still available and we've done other things and that's just grown and grown and grown. Now what? Now we're talking, we're going, we're doing um, renewals, more leasing. We partner up with AWS who also does some OCRing. I don't know if you guys are aware of this. So you can actually have an upload process on your web and it goes into the AWS um, portal and they have an OCR process. So now what we do is we've eliminated any eyeballing of a potential prospect. So you fill out a credit criminal app, it's all going in OCR'd, we take that data and we throw it into our, the person that we use to process the credit criminal and we don't have to eyeball it anymore. Whereas normally we'd have to fill out a form, that form would have to come in and be transferred to eRenter, eRenter would come back to us. So now thanks to the OCR, we've eliminated another eyeballing process. Hence, roll forward. Next big thing, voice. So we said, um, how difficult would it be to start to put voice into some of our units? Let's make smart apartments. This has been a conversation we've been having. Everybody's heard of smart apartments probably for the last 15, 20 years. Well, in real estate, we are a, a, really a bass awkward technology company. I mean, when I came here in 2008 to Stonehenge and I rolled out voicemail to email and fax to email, it was like, holy macaroni, what the heck? I never thought this could ever happen. When I took a Blackberry out of their hand and gave them a Windows-based mobile phone, it was, ah, voice. Smart apartments, something as simple as the blinds. So you rent an apartment in New York and you have a south-facing window in the summertime, the sun rises and sets east to west. Unfortunately, it's got a little tilt to the south. So if you have a south-facing window and you leave your air conditioning off and you come home at 7 o'clock at night after work, temperature's like 95 degrees in your unit. So something as simple as asking Alexa or telling Alexa and building this skill, we say, Alexa, I'm going to work. <clears throat> now in that skill, this work is deemed until 6 p.m., so automatically at 5.30, Alexa turns on the air conditioning units in these units. So when you come home, your apartment's cooled off. Same thing with blinds, same thing with lights. Any sort of control from a smart device that we can view, any IoT device, we're there. We've also incorporated that into our gym, our gym and our fitness centers. So now when somebody's on a treadmill, we have the little uh, Bluetooth, uh, what do we call them, beacons? and they could tell if somebody's on the treadmill. So now when you wanna go use the fitness center and you go to your resident app, it'll tell you, hey, the three treadmills are taken. Or same thing with our washing machine and dryers now, all thanks to the Amazon voice, we can talk to Alexa and get this information. Hey Alexa, are there any treadmills available in the gymnasium? Two are available, it'll respond. Things like that, turning on and off the HVAC. So we said, this is great for the tenants. Gives it a great, delightful experience. Good retention for us, a really nice wow, a sell feature. How can it help us on the corporate side? That's where it really started to kick in and help us. So we have some skills that Eric was going over. When we first started doing this, which was less than, a hair less than nine months ago from beginning of the project till the rollout, we had 
20 skills, I think, at the beginning that we were testing. And you heard Ayal ask how many units are available at Stonehenge 86. Um, we now have over 100 of those skills and adding every day because departments have bought into the fact that it's a whole lot easier to speak your commands rather than having to get back to whatever you're doing, even if it's your mobile app, you go, you go into a Salesforce app and you've got to tap, tap, swipe, run a report and see the result. Asking the question for a simple one elemented question, how many units are available? Do I have any one bedroom units available in the Upper East Side? And having that come back with an answer instantly is priceless. I'll give you a live example of what happened. We were just in a leasing meeting when we kicked this off about two weeks ago, and everybody's sitting there saying, oh, okay, big deal, so it can answer me a question. One of the leasing agents, we put one of these Alexa units at every concierge station in, the, in all of our buildings. So now this person has got a, a prospective tenant, and the tenant's at a showing. They wanted to go see a one-bedroom unit in a particular building. They went up, and they didn't, wasn't really tickling them, so they're down at the lobby and they're communicating and the leasing agent's like, well, what about if I show you another unit? The leasing agent asked the Alexa unit, Alexa, do we have any other one bedroom units available on the Upper East Side? And Alexa answered, yes. And then the question was, Alexa, what building has any one apartment uh, and one bedroom apartments available on the Upper East Side? And it came back with the building name. Then she asked that the units that were available in the building. The prospective tenant was so floored and she started to talk about, you get this as well as you're in your smart apartment. And now they went and go saw the other unit and I don't have to tell you the rest is, you know, the magic happened, so they rented a unit from us. So it was a really great kickoff in this leasing meeting to show how simple, yet if the, if I had to fumble and say, oh, hold on one second, let me see if there's another unit available. Just by doing this, you're already, you know how we are. You're doing this, so am I. All right, you're doing that, and I'm off to do this, and you're, you're not even paying attention. But the fact that they were speaking to the Alexa unit, and the Alexa unit was speaking back, it was, they were amazed. And so that's what happened. Not only leasing, we have our ops people. We have our concierge, so we have people who move in and move out every day. Problem is, elevators, right? You got three people moving in at the same time. Whole lot of elevator space is being taken up. Our concierge can now ask when he gets on his uh, morning shift, Alexa, how many move-ins do I have today? And it'll come back and tell him. He can then ask the times and places of those move-ins and move-outs. So this is the type of stuff that we've done to move forward with Alexa voice. Um, you know, Eric and I were talking also about, you know, just thinking about tenants. Forget about the turning your air conditioning on or off. What happens if you get injured? You know, you get injured and you need a crutch or one of those uh, little dollies if you screw up your knee. And you just sit down on the couch and get yourself in a comfortable position and you forgot to do X, Y, or Z on an on a IoT device or a smart element in your house or your apartment. Now you could tell it to turn on or off without having to get back up again. And I know it sounds really rudimentary, but it's, it's very effective. Where are we now? I think we moved on to the... Oh, so let's talk about rollout. So I said it, it took nine months. We have a developer that we used, and they are Clicker Tech. Um, unbelievable developer. Uh, they were spot on with this solution for us, and we were chatting, hmm, how do we make this happen? What's the rollout? Coming up with a development plan. Within hours, we had Amazon on the phone trying to get a partnership with them, and they were so willing to jump in on this, and we got together, had a several, several meetings, and we were testing this on devices. I gotta tell you, we were using air conditioning devices that were well over 20 years old that had all analog equipment that we were able to make and convert into a smart device being monitored by IoT, little Arduino devices that were costing 20 or 30 bucks to hook up and make it intelligent. The rollout process was very, very simple and straightforward. And like I said, the traction on our side, the corporate side, was very, very quick once we had some live testing and live answers and skills. And the fact that the skill sets now take about, oh, I'm gonna tell you, if I call Click Tech right now, well, maybe not right now, they're in um, Belarus. But if I call them later on and ask for a skill to be implemented that we've wrote a report for, it would take them literally 20 minutes to get that skill into Alexa and up and running, into every single Alexa device across our portfolio. It's all on him. 
So with that being said, we'd like to open up the floor to any questions, whether it be the Salesforce part, the integration part, the Amazon part, and we'd really like to you know, enlighten you on far as voice is really here, it's here to stay, and it's really very useful. Yes, sir. As far as rollout for tenants, right? So in a, in a business, you have an Amazon, right? It's you know, uh, one scenario. If you have tenants, they're not all tied to the same org structure, right? Correct. So when you roll all those skills out, are those on the public marketplace, or is there a way to roll them out to specific? So it's a great question. So security-wise. Yeah. So if you're a tenant in building X, you can't ask it questions about building Y. Same thing on the employee side. So if we have a, let's use a, a building super in building A, he can't go to building B and find out any information. So you can make it as, it'll ride on the granularity of the Salesforce security. And so one of the things I was gonna add there, so I mentioned that shared device model. So very similar in conference rooms, that's what ClickAttack used to represent a device in this building has a set of permissions that can access those. Likewise, in the leasing office, that gives a different set of permissions. So they're actually, uh, I talked with the team at Clicka, and they mentioned that they get way more control with the addition of that location awareness plus the Salesforce security model than just a pure like Salesforce user model on its own. So it just gives you the ability to kind of, you have more levers to pull and push from to control that. And so nothing is available in the public Alexa market for this. Right. But I think as Tom mentioned with like the resident app, you, you still have public options if that's the best way to get to the tenants or get to customers. What's the process for pushing out the new skills? Pushing out? Pushing out new skills. So the process is, it's twofold, right? Like Eric said before, on one, you know, on the Salesforce side, we write a report and we come up with the, the speech that we want it to hone in on and we really basically just turn it over and give it to Clicker and Clicker then goes in and does the development work that says, okay, if these four key phrases are spoken, run this report and give the results in this order. So we can get one result, we can get two results, and or we can ask multiple questions to hone down, like I said before. It's a very, very simple process. Yeah, and so like a, an Alexa skill per se is really defined by an invocation name. So let's use Jeopardy, it's a really simple example. If I say, great point, you know, Alexa, open Jeopardy, that is a skill. If I wanted to add a special daily Even double question happens. to the existing Jeopardy skill, there's no additional, the, the work thing. that's being done there is to say what might people yeah. say, you have to be able to handle that in some kind of a function, <laughs> but the infrastructure stays the same. Thank you don't you. have to really do anything differently. No. Uh, there is a skilled publication and certification process if you want to be in that 50,000 uh, public market. For private skills, it's simply uh, make the changes you want, push it, and it gets updated in your system. So there was no actual action. So the units in the apartments, they don't have to have any updates. They're already connected to the internet they'll just get it live on the fly. Yeah. One other piece of integration that we're doing right now, we're coming out with version 3.0 of the resident app, which is going to have Alexa skills built into the app, so you don't even need to be in the apartment and speak to the Alexa unit. The Alexa <coughs> mobile will recognize and then run the skills from no matter where you are. So turning on air conditioning and lights and blah, 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 is, uh, can be done from anywhere in the world now for their particular unit. And just one thing, uh, while this is back up, I, I think it was really interesting the way Tom described the scenario because if you notice, Alexa is actually a very small piece of this picture. And so with Clicka, you know, they didn't have this huge background of voice. They knew IoT well, they knew microservices, and really that's 90% of the picture here. Yeah. And so I think the really cool thing is voice on top of existing Salesforce apps is just, imagine if you're going to mobile for the first time, it's analogous, it's not the same but you're adding a new interface, but you're able to leverage a lot of your existing expertise. <coughs> Voice design is a very interesting field in its own right. Y you might be tempted to think it's just like building an app, but it, I, I swear it is very different. The things people say, the way they'll say them, how much information do you give, how much information do you ask, there's some really different considerations, but from an architecture technology standpoint, it's not as big of a change as you might think. So, so yes, sir. That line comes down yeah. no, into the microservices. So it's just one of the contributors to many microservices. And then relating to what you're saying, uh, how good is it when you just launch a skill and then does it get better as you know people use it and you learn how to 
how they say the tax day thing. Go ahead. So uh, yeah, there's a couple of things. So one, yes, you're right in that Salesforce is both the kind of backing and the core understanding of the data that's present, right? To know the Ritz Plaza, to know uh, the different buildings, that's all coming from Salesforce. So the, the ever learning part, there's a couple things to that. One is that the Alexa kind of service in its own right is getting better when it hears different people say the same words. So the first time it might hear a word, you know, supercalifragilistic, whatever, it might not know what you're saying. But there are speech scientists who kind of get these little fragments of speech to train the model to get it better. And as it hears more and more, it adjusts to that. So, so our president, Eyal, he's Israeli. You could hear his accent. I don't know if the audio was running when he was speaking. But he's, he's got a heavy Israeli accent. And after three or four requests, Alexa was answering much more consistently with the proper response than it was on the first two or three. And, that, and we were, everybody sat back and was really amazed at how this thing learned in a matter of minutes. It was almost like we had adopted to AI. We had to listen two or three times. Alexa did the same thing. So it was almost human-like, you know, so they were, it was learning on the fly. So I got a funny story. Yeah, so, please. Sorry. So our chairman is Ofer Yardeni, and Ayal's Israeli accent is very deep. Ofer's is deeper. So he wanted to see his executive dash, Ofer's executive dashboard. So we were trying to show him how to ask Alexa this. Well, he has absolutely no patience for this, as you would imagine that any chairman or CEO would. No patience. Yet, we said, you know what? Let's call it funnel. Show me my funnel. And that, that worked. So there was a little bit of frustration, but it, we overcame it. And there's a million ways to, and again, that was a very easy process change. That was, so now you could ask it two ways. Ofer's executive dashboard, because he's not the only one that looks at it, or show me the funnel. And we get the same response. So uh, there's a resource called the Alexa Voice Design Guide online. So it's a bunch of like, good tips and practices to think about when designing voice skills. And so what you described is actually one of the things in that, uh, that list of tips is, Ask people face to face, how would you do this? Don't tell them what to say. And you're going to get tons of different responses. And so collect all of those. And you can train the, the first part of the skill, the voice model, to expect all of those. So the more training data you provide, the better Alexa can handle that. You know, If you only have find me opportunity something as the way to fetch a sales opportunity, you're going to miss a ton of different ways that people are going to use that. There's custom vocabulary, there's slang, there's all those kind of things. So again, there is a, it's a two-sided uh, street. You, know, you have to also provide some information, but Alexa it does get smarter and handle more and more uh, pronunciation as well. And to add to that, I want to ask you a question, sir. Are the, anything that's underlined here are all key fields in their actual fields in Salesforce. So rented is a unit status field. So it's an, an actual value in there. So like Eric is saying, these are the tips that you should use. Don't, don't be vague and as best you can. Try to use the values that are in Salesforce fields to come back with the proper, mo most accurate response. Yes, sir. May I just please? So it's great that you pointed that out. We haven't done it on the enterprise side yet, but for the tenants. Um, so one of the things that's built into the app is they can invite guests, right? They need their dog walker to come in, so on and so forth. It will give them a reminder, and it will say to them, hey, Alexa, don't forget, um, uh, uh, hey, Tom, because it'll know my name from the lease name. It'll say, hey, Tom, don't forget Eric is coming by today at 6.15 PM. So any guest reminders, we do have it speaking out to them. The funny thing is about that, uh, we were worried about the eeriness. You know, people get a little eerie if the, it starts talking to you and telling you what to do. 
but the reminder of the guests coming in, we figured we'd start there, but we haven't done anything on the enterprise side as far as like a, a reminder, which is a, a great idea. Can it be done? Absolutely. And just as easily as you do on the input side, the output is, is just as easy. It's just an alert and a tickle that Alexa has to do something. It's really not as mystical that we, I mean, we all thought it was. And when we first went on this, we thought, for sure, this is a year and a half out. This is some you know, fluff that we're just going to have to battle through and work and work, and, and it really wasn't. So, so Alexa, uh, communications can be via mobile app, mobile app. Yeah, so actually, if you, the Alexa app that you use to like, control your device, set it up, also has Alexa in it, so you can speak to it just like you would an Echo device. It, it is a little more limited in all the things it can do, but it is very similar. Um, and I was going to add a little more color from a kind of Alexa technical side. So we think of proactive notifications in a couple ways. One, today you can do that by saying, Alexa, like, remind me of this at this time, and you'll get a kind of a pop-up notification and, and that. There is a notification framework that is under a developer preview that um, if you get package deliveries via oh, that's Alexa, that's the same deliveries. kind of thing. It's like it'll glow yellow, I think, and you say, Alexa, what's up? And it'll be like, oh, you have a notification about something. Uh, so Clicka, I know, is doing that for some of the tenant skills yeah, we and have notification. That for the package deliveries as well. Yeah. Um, and then the third way that I was going to say is this interesting in that the way we approach this is we think of voice first, we think voice is important, but we also know voice is not everything. So maybe a push notification via an app or an email sometimes may also suffice to be like, hey, just remember to do this. And a big part about what we think voice brings is it reduces the friction of that activity. Because if, if you've got a reminder saying, hey, you have to go enter your sales notes in Salesforce, and you're like, oh, I have to open that, I have to go through all these flows, versus, hey, Alexa, you know, tell my sales assistant my last meeting notes were blah. And if it knew your calendar, if it knew which account you were at, and it just did that for you. I mean, ideally, what, it, what I'd like to see is today is send a uh, text message saying you, uh, your, your boss wants to talk to you. But it's really not your boss. It's your boss. It's voice over Alexa asking you the, the question Salesforce is asking on the boss's behalf. Yeah, it's, it's funny. I'm Tom stealing and I, your idea. I'm going back, and we're going to put this on the enterprise side. You got to give me a card because I'll let you know how we do. <laughs> I really like that. That's a great idea. Yeah, it, it, there's a lot you can do today, and this technology is changing all the time. There's more and more functionality coming out uh, with Alexa comms, with chatbots, other AWS tools like uh, Lex, which is our chatbot solution. There's there's a lot of ways to kind of get what you're looking for. And so again, uh, happy for you to stop by our booth and we can talk in more detail. I was just going to put this up in case people start bailing out. Now we do have a couple giveaways at our booth in the Customer Success Expo. Uh, we also have live demos of the actual templates I mentioned before, so sales Dead assistant, some help desk kind of stuff. So feel free to stop by. We're happy to talk through more technical detail too. But so, yeah, we still have a few minutes for questions. So. Yep, that's a great question. So because Alexa is part of Amazon, customer privacy, trust, security is all super important to us. Uh, in regards to specific handling of data, I think that's a good one to come by, talk to us at the booth. We can share some ideas and strategies. Uh, I will say in regards to purchasing, Alexa this year announced support for in-skill payments as well as using Amazon purchasing information. So that way customers don't have to provide credit card numbers or something like that directly to a skill. They can actually refer to an Amazon kind of wallet payment method. And so that allows skills to do things like, oh, you get, you know, with Jeopardy, you get the sixth question of the day that other people only get five. Or it can be entitlements like for a game, you get an extra pack. So there's a bunch of these different strategies that we can you know, talk about or, or suggest to, to address that sort of a thing. One more. We got time for one more. Here we go. Uh, can I let, so you're saying, you got to go to the booth, by the way. So, the, oh, yeah, well, you guys, <laughs> so you're saying that like one super in building A can't find out about building B, right? Correct. Is Alexa smart enough to know like by voice or something like that who it is that's talking to it? So, so from an authentication standpoint, could you lock down based on a two things. voice signature? Yes, but more importantly, um, the Alexa unit itself is assigned in Salesforce to a unit. Okay. 
and so that unit is tied to a person's profile, you know, permission set, if you would, of what they can and can't ask and or get results from a question. So last year, we announced a uh, ability for third-party developers to have access to what we call kind of that voice profile information. So if you have an Echo today, when you do voice purchasing, you can actually see that in action. Or if you ask your device, Alexa, who am I? If you've set up that voice profile, it might say, oh, you're Eric, and you're in Eric's account. Whereas if Tom talked to my device, it would say, I don't know who you are, but you're in Eric's account. So uh, that's not available to the public yet. So again, for a household, there's some things that you can do with it. Uh, but it's, it's something that you know, we have the preview, we, and we're having conversations about it. So um, in the meantime, there are other things like you know, putting those balls in place inside of Salesforce to also restrict that. Uh, we have some interesting demos and things that we do with multi-factor. So if you launch a skill, it might say, hey, I've sent a push to your phone. Just hit yes to prove that it's you. So we have lots of customers that are trying different things. You know, we're still pretty early in this phase to see you know, what works best. There's a, there's a balance between the friction as well as security, and, and every customer is going to be different for that. That's also a great point because in part of the app, the things that we're thinking about you know, now, the crazy world we live in, are everything that we do with the voice and any sort of thing on the app has got to have a, um, an access code, a, a two-part generation authentication type of, you know, so that's important to realize. But anyway, okay. um, yeah. go ahead, Eric. No, thank you, Tom, for being here. I appreciate oh, all your help you. and support. Appreciate and it. feel free to come visit us at the booth, sign up for more giveaways, and ask us more questions. Thank you, everybody. Thank you Enjoy very much. your dream for us.